Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I think I had the uh, microphone muted. There's a setting <laughs> and I must have uh, used one of my very large fingers mm. and tapped the wrong button. I always say we're always, we're always one click away. You know, we got yeah. nine out of 10 clicks, but there's one more or one that's, un, you know, inadvertently done. So yeah, that's great. Uh, th things are good. How about you? Good. Very good. Uh, I live in Oregon and things are actually sunny. So uh, it's good to have that. Mm. Um, uh, how are things there weather wise? Uh, well, so it's cold. spring. I mean, it's cold, but not like super cold, but we did get 20 inches of snow on Tuesday. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So we get snow more or less. We can, we can get snow from Halloween to um, St. Patrick's day. So okay. it's not that surprising, a little surprising on the volume, but, um, but it's melting rapidly and, you know, you go outside and it's birds chirping and it's still, you could read the newspaper outside, you know, daylight saving is, um, you know, we've got some real long evening light already. So definitely signs of spring. And if there was no snow, you'd start to see some, you know, crocuses and tulips coming up. So eventually. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I, I'm ready for spring. I um, I have three kids and they're all uh, under five. And so <laughs> out, outside is a key area of our house that we really enjoy and need. And yes. uh, it just makes life easier. Uh, so Understood. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There was a time um, when I uh, way back when, when we had four under the age of five. <laughs> oh, wow. So, That's awesome. So, I mean, all you have to have is one. And, 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 and then sure. certainly if you have two children, then it's a little bit, you know, um, but yeah, the outdoor time, burn off some, burning off some energy and, um, yep. and you can only stay outside so long with versus in the warmer weather. So that's a good yeah. thing. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, we're not quite at four o'clock, but um, just to start off, um, yeah, again, my name, you can call me Bill. That's fine. Uh, my sure. persona on here is Land Tax or Memes, but that was really just the name I came up with. And okay. it just kind of went went beyond what I could control. So that's fine. <laughs> um, and uh, just kind of to introduce myself a teeny bit to you so you know a little mm -hmm. bit more about me. And then um, I want to hear more about your background and um, uh I am about 32 years old and I have a family, I have a wife and kids and I live in Oregon and I'm, mm. I'm uh, a, a professional uh, auditor by like trade. And that's what mm -hmm. I do in my day job. But um, what I like to do as kind of just in my uh, act, off time is to educate people about Henry George. But then also my goal is to really kind of get people thinking about American democracy, uh, civic republicanism, that whole mm -hmm. sphere of thought mm -hmm. that goes um, at the core of what kind of a lot of founders were trying to get to and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. I just think Henry George is an amazing person. He also seems like the <laughs> ultimate good guy. Like he just seems like yeah. a good, genuine dude. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. he. it's sometimes shocking to see someone like that be successful. So yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah. So basically I want to hear about you and just, uh, I guess like kind of my first question and maybe kind of start it off is, um, where did you first hear about Henry George and why did you want to write a book on him, um, specifically? Uh, so. All right. So do you, you want to hold off on that until we, we, uh, we boot up? Is that the, uh, I think until basically it's... at this point we are, um, I think it's pretty informal so we can start whenever and maybe you could uh couch that off uh as maybe a way to start introducing yourself like uh, um right yeah that'd be great okay well my name is edward t o'donnell everybody knows me as ed and uh my my real job is i'm a i'm a very very lucky guy i'm a tenured college professor at a fine liberal arts institution uh holy cross college in worcester massachusetts and um so and i've been there 20 something years i also was a student there several thousand years oh, wow, ago that's so awesome. yeah so it's very kind of a kind of a cool thing in in that regard, and um, so yeah, so I'm American history is my field. Gilded Age, Progressive Era is kind of the you know 1870, 1920 is the period that I focus on the most. And uh, let's see, how did I? So my graduate school uh, work began back in 1988. I moved to New York City with my wife and uh, got to, uh, took up residence at Columbia University and. You know, the first year or so of graduate school is just tons and tons of reading and all that. But at some at some point, you need to pick your dissertation topic. And I had all kinds of ideas and, you know, 
three or four possible 19th century uh, topics. I was always interested in taxes for some strange reason. Like I wrote my first, my master's thesis, first year of graduate school was on school taxation in New York City, a big controversy about the, you know, with this emerging thing called public schooling and how are we going to pay for it? And property taxes became the most, at the time, the logical way to do it. Um, not everybody was excited about that. So, um, so I, that was probably one of the ways in which I came to, to got interested in, in Henry George. But I think one of my professors recommended I read up on him. He said, you should look into Henry George. He's kind of hits, hits several marks because I was interested in reform, New York, or, you know, urban history, um, immigration, and, you know, and I guess on taxes as well. Um, and so he kind of combines all those things. And so anyway, sometime in the early 90s, I committed to writing my dissertation on uh, Henry George and the great labor uprising of the late 19th century. And that, that you know, began my, my odyssey, 1995. I graduated from, you know, finished my dissertation, got my PhD, got a job at City University in New York uh, at Hunter College and um, was there for, I got, I got tenure there. I was there for a while, but then uh, this job that I'm currently in 21 years ago opened up and, you know, it's just a lot, much lower cost of living, a little more space, you know, so Massachusetts yeah. was a, was a, a really good move. I, like I said, I'm, I'm very lucky. And um, through, so that, you know, typically, you, you know, you get your PhD in year, let's say, so in my case, 95, and then you get your job ideally right away and you know, your tenure track job. And usually, you know, three, four, five years into it, that book comes out. That was certainly my plan. I got a contract for it from Columbia University Press, but I will spare you the details, but you know, life is what happens when you're making other plans kind of thing. Sometimes good things came along that distracted me from finishing the book. Sometimes, you know, family crises and that, that sort of thing. So anyway, um, the book finally came out in 2015, of course, in a weird way, it's a better book because I'm an older, wiser historian. Also, it's a more relevant book because I don't think anybody in 1995 was saying we are in a second Gilded Age, you know, and, and invoking all that, all these metaphors and references to the late 19th century and robber barons and, and, mm -hmm. and also talking about Henry George, you know, as, as a relevant person in the 21st century. So, um, so the, as I, as I said, when the book finally came out, I said, I have really good news, you know, from uh, good news for me, the bad news for America is that the Gilded Age is now a hot topic again. It's good news for me because I have a book coming out about Henry George and the Gilded Age. So, yeah. So, yeah. So that's, so that's how, how that all uh, transpired. So yeah, I've been living with and thinking about and writing about Henry George for a, for a pretty long time. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome <clears throat> to hear that background and, um, uh yeah it is interesting seeing that yeah um with the great recession or whatever you know global financial crisis it gets mm. all sorts of names and then kind of uh now with where we're headed with um automation and um with the mm -hmm. recent bank collapses and uh with the fight the housing market being as uh wild as it is and so unaffordable uh, especially for millennials like myself and younger people yeah um these issues are creeping back up and like the same it's just like more examples of like wow henry george said said this about the vacant lot and yep. here we have all this stuff in like detroit and new york even and so that's uh yeah that's awesome that that got you started through your dissertation and um your book and uh, i haven't had the pleasure of reading your book all the way through but i have watched almost all of the presentations of yours that you've given um and yeah, you've really like touched on a lot of different key topics and i've really enjoyed that it's been really valuable to uh see the dimension of henry george beyond land value tax because i love land right. value tax i'm very pro that policy mm -hmm. but that's not gonna especially for people who would want to promote that idea, that's not going to be necessarily what is going to get most people really fired up is this specific policy proposal. But the way he talked about inequality, like in the yep. crime of poverty um, and just, it goes way beyond that. But um, uh, yeah. So I kind of have like some other questions that I could ask. Like, sure. They're all written now and they're nothing like wild. Um, they're just kind of, maybe touching on different topics that you've spoken about before or like areas that 
kind of I thought wanted to bring up. So maybe I could just uh, start on one and then we can just kind of go with the flow. Sounds great. Okay, awesome. So do you, um, have you ever heard of William S. Uren? He's an Oregonian social reformer. Yes. Yeah. He's one of, I can't remember any of the details, but the name is so distinct that I remember, you know, towards the end of my book, I have a long, a couple of pages actually of, you know, all the people who at one point or another said, you know what turned me into a reformer? You know what turned me into a progressive? You know what turned me into a labor leader? Um, was reading Progress and Poverty by Henry oh. George. So, so that name um, stands out as one of the sort of, of the first generation of Georgists that really, you know, or, or George influenced reformers. Yeah. Um, I, the reason I bring him up is being from Oregon, we have what's called the Oregon system, which is like the initiative mm-hmm. referendum and recall. And he yeah. actually uh, popularized that secretly. Like he wanted the single tax, but he did the popular democracy route as like kind of a back door to, mm-hmm. although it's kind of the front door. <laughs> um, yeah. But um that's kind of where the where I thought your book and your uh, work really connected. And um, you Ren was just one example of like kind of those. He loved single tax, but he was way beyond that. Um, mm-hmm. And just were there other people uh, or uh, that you think were particularly important that maybe people don't really connect or um, with Henry George. George? Yeah, George influenced people. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd have to, you know, when you write a book, you know, now it's eight eight years old, so you know, I have to think about it. But but even just you know, people like um, F- Florence Kelly, who was a big social reformer, anti child labor uh, activist, social, you know, settlement house worker, Jane Adams, another settlement house activist, um, Eugene Debs, uh, the great you know labor leader and socialist candidate uh, in the twenty early twentieth century. Um, those are just three that come to mind, but there's just, um, you know, just a long, long list of almost anybody that, you know, became, uh, I think Francis Perkins, you know, is another one who, you know, emerges as a, a classic kind of capital P progressive in the early 20th century. Certainly those folks, um, were either directly or indirectly, re- you know, influenced by, by George, uh, you know, again, the story is often the say somebody saying, you know, when I was 17 years old, somebody handed me a copy of Progress and Poverty. Um, and so it, it has a and mostly, you know, people took from it what they needed. You know, so some people became single taxers, but a lot of other people just, you know, the, the line I use in my book is most people or not most people, but a, he- a really large number of percentage of George people influenced by George were taken by his his diagnosis of America's ills, not so much his uh, prescription to, to cure it, which was the single tax. Sure. So there's tremendous value in that, though, because he does have this way of saying, look, um, inequality is always, you know, stalking advancing civilizations. And, you know, as more complex a civilization becomes, the more wealthier it becomes, the more, you know, advanced it becomes, inequality is is just going to get worse and worse and worse, unless, you know, that society is always wor- watching out for it and doing things to make sure that it doesn't, you know, get out of hand and that they, you know, very small percentage. He's one of the first people to to use the term, uh, the, 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 the 1%, hang on, I'm just going to turn off my ringer there, um, to, to use the term the 1%. So, you know, and then other, you know, several other of his claims are, you know, extremely important, which is essentially, Inequality unchecked will lead to, uh, you know, it will destroy democracy. You you'll reach a certain point where democracy will will simply be over. You know, and when he was writing, he's saying democracy is kind of a shell of itself. Sure, everybody has the right to vote, but if you have the right to vote and you work sixty hours a week and you can't feed your family, you're not a free born citizen of the American Republic. You're a Russian serf. You know, you're you're mm-hmm. some unfree person. Um, unlike your father and your grandfather and, and people before you, uh, and it's not your fault. You are being driven into that condition of inequality and poverty and hopelessness and lack of opportunity by economic forces that are made by laws and made by policies. Mm-hmm. And we can fix that by changing those laws and those policies uh, if we only face up to it. So, you yeah. know, and that, when you when I tell students that or talk to people about that, they're like, yeah, inequality is destroying our democracy right in front of our eyes in 2023. Uh, and the power of monopoly power, you know, billionaire power to influence and warp 
our democracy is happening right in front of our eyes. And it, you know, George would, uh, would recognize it immediately. He'd, he'd be kind of, you know, obviously a person plucked out of a different century, but he would recognize the conditions pretty, pretty quickly as being exactly what he was talking about. Yeah, there. It's funny. I was watching a TikTok video that was kind of like, um, you know, you when you see environmental degradation, and it had uh, Ohio train explosion. Yeah. When you see uh, wealth inequality and all these different things, um, it was really interesting because it was like, wow, uh, it didn't. You know, I think the person in mind just kind of had general social criticism in mind. But I was just thinking Henry George because that's mm. the first person because of his focus on inequality and um, especially on monopoly. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I think that's something that a lot of Georgists maybe miss the um, in the modern era uh, or just it's kind of been forgotten is that he very much had a focus on uh, taming uh, natural monopolies or things like uh, the, uh, the streetcars. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, I think it's Tom Johnson, the mayor of Cleveland, was yep. really influential in, like, taming the streetcar monopoly. Yeah. It sounds yeah, because, funny to us. <laughs> but, the, but they had the, you know, they were billionaire, or they were very wealthy corporations. And they were really big corporations uh, that ran the streetcar systems in big cities. So, uh, you know, that and, you know, the, the water system, any of these public uh, utilities, um, and, you know, nationally, the telegraphs and the railroads, where you know, George was not the only one that was saying, we have to nationalize these things. These are, mm -hmm. you know, they're indispensable to, we can't get rid of them. We need, in fact, they're doing wonderful things for us, but we need somebody, you know, in the name of the people needs to be in control of these things. And, you know, it's a very per persuasive argument. I think it probably worked a lot more on the local level, like with Johnson, but um, it certainly was a, an argument where people very uncomfortable with state control of things, very uncomfortable of socialism and, you know, uh, rag radicalism could be kind of coaxed into that by a persuasive argument and good mm -hmm. examples. And George was just a master at that. You know, he's quoting the Bible. He's writing. I mean, when he really, if you, the technical parts of the book where he's talking about rent and things like that are just like, oof, this is hard stuff to read. <laughs> I have to read every line three times. Um, but when he's just on a run talking about, you know, the what how societies evolve and how inequality will undermine everything and you know and then it, it's irreversible he, he talks he uses the same kind of language that we do now about climate change you know you'll reach mm -hmm. a kind of tipping point where you can't the, the 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 acceleration of climate change will reach a point where you can't even slow it down let alone stop it and he used the same imagery about inequalities is a certain point at which you can't wake up one day and say finally let's fix this you may be too late you know the republic mm -hmm. may be gone yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's scary to think um I, I mean, maybe we should be hopeful that we've made it this far uh, and mm -hmm. that there is some resilience to our institutions. But I do think that the last, I guess, eight years, I don't know, six years have been a yeah. huge challenge for our institutions handling not just the economics, which leads to the politics, but just the politics of it. Um, I know in my lifetime, the rhetoric alone has gotten far more toxic. And it's surprising mm -hmm. to think about that. Uh, my first time I voted was the Obama McCain election. So yep. there was a lot of hope and change rhetoric. It was much more, um, we can do something about it. And now mm -hmm. it's much more uh, doom and gloom uh, from everyone. <laughs> right. There's a lot of folks that think, can we just slow, you know, can we, can we have less terrible things happen or can we have small, terrible things happen on a smaller scale? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so there, but I mean, there there is also hope in in some of the things that have happened in in the re, in under Biden, where you know some of the things. I mean, this is the other theme of Henry George, which is um, the common good, right? You know, we we have this. We've been at war with ourselves as Americans, you know, over the from day one, actually, about individualism versus the common good. But we've also most Americans appreciate both, and certainly the founders mm -hmm. believe we're not. I mean. I, we don't have enough time, uh, but I mean, I could go on a long run about, you know, libertarianism as this new fetish, not new, but like it comes back every now and again. And now mm -hmm. it seems to be, uh, you know, a really uh, point of fascination with people. And, you know, you just have to I could say a lot of it, but I would say one thing, which is that the founders 
were absolutely positively not anything that could be co you know characterized as libertarians. They believed in liberty, they believed in individual rights and all of that, and we should still believe in those things today, but they also believed in the common good, that we need to enact policies and do things that help the great majority of people and we'll all be the better for it. And sure, we might have to fork over some taxes for it and all of that, but it's a good it it's a small price to pay for clean water and educated populace and, and all of that. So that's another thing that you know George really was was pushing at, which pushing back on, which was this kind of ramp, this ideology of laissez-faire and unrestricted 100 percent individual rights to do anything one wants with one's property. Nobody can tell them uh, what to do. So I think that's another direct connection to you know the part of the problems that we that we face today. Yeah, I think there's a quote from him where he says something about a professor even saying like mm. a professor of today says like uh, people just need to work harder or something yeah. along those lines and and just uh, offer charity and everything will be OK. And it's like, yeah, honestly, like uh, it had it directly was like I thought of Ayn Rand uh, immediately. Yep. I was like he predicted her over a hundred years or whatever before she ever existed. He was yep. thinking about her, what she was going to say. Um, and it, I don't know if you ever have ever read um, Alice Shrugged, um, but what's kind of interesting is mm. uh, uh, Galt's Gulch or Mulligan's Valley, which is where it takes place, is mm. operated by a benevolent landlord, Mister Mulligan or whatever. And so, like <laughs> yeah. Georges like to say, hey you're missing a whole key point like there's capitalists and there's workers but where's right. the landlord like um in her worldview they're just absent there's nothing and yeah. so it's just, so i think maybe henry george highlights uh today like the people who receive with merely through ownership no production like we're seeing right. it like with patents um <clears throat> And just intellectual property in general is just very all over the place, um, hard to handle. Um, so, yeah, I guess, um, what do you think of uh, Henry George's other policies? Like, for example, um, the New York Times had an article from Professor Jill Lepore in 2011. There was an mm -hmm. article about his um, support of the secret ballot. And Yes, that's um, right. That's another one of his... <laughs> Yeah, the Australian I, ballot, as they like yeah. to call it. Yeah. What, what do you make of maybe George's other policies outside of LVT? Um, maybe there are ones we aren't familiar with or aren't brought up, or maybe they're too specific uh, to the area uh, or to the time. Um, are there any other besides secret ballot that he was a big proponent of uh, that, from your research? Yeah, let me. I mean, the secret ballot is one of those things that um, it's almost a tack on, right? It's You can see the connection because nothing is going to happen if you know none of the things that george and georges want to see happen is going to happen if the political system is you know in the hands of you know people doing pulling all the levers in smoke filled uh rooms and so you know the the australian ballot which is basically they australia was it's not the first place but where they popularized private you know secret voting where you go behind a curtain and make your choices and all most americans think that's the way we vote but of course you know back in the 1820s and 1830s when everybody was getting the vote you just went to meetings and raised your hand and or said to said it out loud or you and you when you walked up to a polling site you literally said jackson or <laughs> hulk or you know you you said it out loud so and there was a certain vir virtue there that you know voting should be literally transparent everybody should know but of course late 19th century you've got political machines that you know have poll watchers that will beat the you know they, if they see that you haven't voted the right way um, they will threaten you and beat you and make sure that you you know, are made an example of. So people who are thinking of voting for the Labor Party or for the whatever party uh, won't do it. So I think that there's there's a connection there. And he certainly was one of the people that kind of popularized it at that kind of tipping point in the 1890s. And it's pretty quickly adopted, um, mm -hmm. starting in the, you know, mostly in the early 20th century. And now we we wouldn't recognize voting. You know, we wouldn't want it any other way. But it's one of those examples of like nothing. One of my many, you know, 11th commandments of, or I have 10 commandments of history. I would think there were like 14 of them, but one of them is nothing has always been like everything has evolved and changed. And it, you don't have to go that far back to find that, oh, what we think of as always having been is, you know, we didn't always uh, 
you know, uh, players didn't always stand on the sidelines of NFL games for the national anthem. They simply never did that until after 9-11, you know, and and then, then that becomes a point of contention, you know, 20 years later. So anyway, interesting thing. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else specifically with, um, with George, we would point to, or he would show up in a, you know, an encyclopedia article as a, as a kid, I mean, one, yeah. So one, and it's not a, it's a, it's a more negative thing, but it's also one we can unpack and understand, which is that in the 1870s, he's out there in California. He's a reform editor of several newspapers, the, and it's a depression decade, huge economic collapse, and it's also California is caught up in this virulent anti-Chinese campaign mm-hmm. uh, to to, and people are pointing at the Chinese and scapegoating them for a being very different, being non-European, being non-Christian. Um, but also saying they are also putting Americans out of work. They they work 20 hours a day. They can sustain themselves on on rice and water. They're unnatural. They are literally each individual Chinese person is a is a monopoly. You know is is of you know undercutting Americans. And so the anti Chinese movement is very virulent, very powerful uh, in California. And California is the reason why we end up with the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's really lobbyists from California making that happen in 1882. Um, and so you can go back to George's editorials in the 1870s and see he does say some pretty nasty, racist mm-hmm. things about the, about the Chinese. So we can't, you know, let them off the hook by saying, oh, sure, well, everybody was doing it. But in his, you know, it's not if you are a reformer, you are trying to you know, diagnose social problems. And so for a lot of people, it was it's it seemed obvious in mm-hmm. those days that the Chinese were somehow not fitting into our social, political, economic arrangements and therefore they were they were a problem so Mm -hmm. he was not alone i mean one scholar of the you know period i think said progressivism stopped the chinese right you could be Mm -hmm. very racially tolerant believe in you know rights and citizenship for free emancipated enslaved people you could believe in you know immigration and multiculturalism but you know that you would stop at the chinese to accept Mm -hmm. you know that was sort of the outer Mm -hmm. limit for a lot of people and he fell into that however um, after 1879, uh, after 1880, the, he, he's on record. He doesn't necessarily embrace the Chinese, but he never goes off on a rant about um, the, the Chinese as being a, a major problem. And you know, mm-hmm. speaks in a much, in much more in the language of tolerance um, and inclusion, to use our modern terms, uh, than he had previously. Sure. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting <clears throat> to hear that he kind of evolved a little bit, or maybe. Yeah. Um, understood <laughs> um my understanding you know i've read some about this issue because i'm very interested in what um henry george had to say but um it sounds like there was also the potential and i would uh, definitely want your thought on this that um there was some angle about the chinese labors that were basically they were almost you know for lack of a better word enslaved or you know almost indentured yep. servants and so some of it was uh, the pushback was like, wow, they're just like bringing in basically what are slaves now. And like, yeah. it's a new and so we can't allow that. Um, and then it was colored with a lot of racism and other arguments probably bleeding together. Um, is that true at all? Or, um... Yeah, th- I mean, that that is part of the thing. So the monopoly accusation was also at that slightly higher level, macro level saying, Many of these people are brought here by labor agents, unscrupulous, you know, exploitive, you know, overlords who secretly, because it's illegal, uh, but Mm -hmm. secretly maintain control of these people, take half their wages, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, and Mm -hmm. and they they could be used um, as strike breakers or at the very Mm -hmm. least to, you know, show up in a mining camp or show up in a railroad site and either indirectly or directly be responsible for wages to be lowered, you know, where a, a hiring, you know, a hiring agent says well this crew is working this group of 20 is willing to work for a dollar a day and but this other group of group of 20 is work willing to work for 92 cents a day so um i'm going with them and what that group happens to be you know the uh, the chinese group so yeah there was definitely a lot of um animosity on aimed at it from from that kind of that sort of perceived notion of monopoly as well okay that makes total sense um I guess it kind of also brings up another question that I have is that 
Um, Henry George had a decent amount of influence on China through Sun Yat-sen mm -hmm. and then maybe through some other social reformers. And the, te the connections are less strong, but like uh, there's a gentleman named Wolf Ladajinsky, who was an American um, bureaucrat, essentially, who helped inspire land reform in Korea and Japan and Taiwan and China to an extent, mm -hmm. um, and like Northern Vietnam, I guess, or South Vietnam. Um, and so there, do you, how is that possible? It seems like Henry George, if he was so very anti-Chinese for a long time, or at least rhetorically, um, how yeah. did that come to be? Maybe, maybe you don't have an opinion on that, but it seems like an oddity of history. A little bit. Well, I think a lot of, you know, by the time Sun Yat-sen who spent a lot of time in America. I don't know when he found George, but I'm guessing it was when he's living in New York, yeah. um, you know, in the early 20th century, um, that he, that's where he probably found George. And so a lot of people, George begins in 1879. Uh, they, they know maybe a little bit of his backstory, but the, it's the publication of Progress and Poverty. That's the landmark book that, you know, grabs everybody's attention and is, you know, to this very day available, still in publication, still available in, in multiple languages. So, and George was was dead by then, too. So mm -hmm. this is like a I, I'm guessing for Sun Yat-sen, it was a book that's, you know, he was interested in land reform and what would happen if the revolution in China actually succeeded. What would we do with this, you know, feudal system? Um, so he was probably casting about. And I, and I think he he did. He read widely on questions of of land and, and mm -hmm. reform and so forth. And someone, you know, he must have come across Henry George's uh progress and poverty and, and read it i don't think he so for him i don't think he he, he might have spent his entire life not ever knowing this earlier yeah. chapter of george being uh, on record as pretty anti-chinese okay that makes total sense that yeah. makes total sense um what do you think henry george i there were so one of the things that I feel like the Georgist movement has maybe been lacking on is a real engagement with the intricacies of race and land um, and economics. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe in the past, maybe there were instances where it was better and worse. Um, but uh, there are some examples, like I think his name is Herbert Harrison, who was part of the uh, Harlem um, God, he has a name. I can't remember. Um, but he yeah. was very influential in the early like civil rights movement. Like we're talking proto civil rights, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Um, but he was a socialist and then he became a single taxer. But I guess this leads me to a broader question of what do you think Henry George's engagement was with other racists like African-Americans? Um, I guess. I don't know what the other example, Native Americans would be maybe another example mm. that would be relevant, but I haven't heard anything about that. So that's kind of. Yeah. So I don't think he has, um, certainly with Native Americans probably doesn't have any relationship whatsoever. I mean, it's entirely possible. Many, you know, by the 1880s, 1890s, there were notable Native Americans who came to came East to do lecture tours and, you know, talk about their plight and that sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, Chief Joseph, you know, was in the East quite a bit. So it's entirely possible that George would have, you know, met a, a Native American representative. Um, I, to the extent, I'm pretty sure he doesn't use them as, a, as an example of land monopoly. You know, like once you mm -hmm. lose your land, you're, you're, you're toast. Yeah. Um, he, that, which, and this is why when he's writing his book, you know, in, in the 1870s, Ireland becomes one of his good examples. And then it, you know, it connects with actual events on the ground. So the Irish... Americans, Irish uh, nationalists, you know, are kind of in, in, in a land reform uprising in the early mm -hmm. 1880s. And they turn to this guy, Henry George, who's not Irish, he's not Catholic, but they say, this guy, his, his ideas are spot on, you know, land for the people. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that's his first sort of big audience. Um, he didn't expect, expect that at all. Um, but for African Americans, he does cite, you know, the, he says, look, you know, look what happened if we emancipated 4 million enslaved people and we didn't give them land. And now they are living in only a few notches above slavery under the mm -hmm. thumb of the same people that once owned them. Uh, so if you, if you don't have access to land, you know, resources, uh, you know, an equal shot of these things, you are, you know, you're, you're subject to the whims of other people. You're not free. You're not a freeborn, fully independent opportunity, opportunity seeking, uh, you know, American citizen. And so it, and, and he, I'm trying to think of other examples of um, 
Frank Foster was a prominent labor leader in the Knights of Labor, African American, probably the most prominent figure in that in that period. And they became friendly. And I'm pretty sure Frank Foster introduces Henry George at the nominating convention. So in 1886, in his famous run for mayor of New York City, um, I think at that at that moment where they're about to nominate him in this Labor Party, the most unlikely thing ever, really starts to take off. Um, I think Frank Foster is the one who introduces Henry George. He definitely introduces him at some key moment, and I'm pretty sure it's then. Gotcha. Gotcha. Was the audio just a little funky there, maybe? Um, it kind of was being odd on my end, but I can hear you now. Totally. Well, I was doing all the talking, so I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, it's um, it's entirely possible. I mean, I'm right down here 12 feet away from my from my router, so hopefully we've got decent uh, yeah, connection. Cool. cool. Yeah, no, it just like cut out a teeny bit when you were just saying yeah. who uh, uh, Mr. Foster connected Henry George with. Yeah, so Frank Foster was a um, a labor leader, the most prominent African American probably in the Knights of Labor, and he befriends Henry George in this tumultuous 1880s. And I think Frank Foster is the one who introduces him at the great nominating convention oh, in New okay. York okay. in October of 1886, when George is going to run for mayor of New York on the Labor Party ticket. So, so he does gotcha. have African American, you know, associate, you know, acquaintances you know figures that he's that he's rubbing elbows with but mm -hmm. um i would say like a lot of people in his situation in the in that late 19th century period his his world is very much male very much um very much white sure sure that makes sense um yeah um so i uh, we can move on to another question what um have you ever read any of christopher england's work um he did a dissertation about the single tax movement. And then I think he just released a book uh, based on his dissertation. Hmm. There is a new book out on Henry George. I've just become aware of it. I think it actually okay. came out maybe like, you know, in the fall. So it's not that long ago, but it's a 2022. So, but I haven't had a, I, all I know is I got an email just the other day saying, Hey, would you please review this book for our okay. you know, publication? Um, and then I think I might've seen that he was interviewed. I don't know if it's the same person. Um, but uh, on a on a history podcast, so okay. it does seem that you know um, it, it was a long run there where there were no books on no recent books on Henry George, and now the, mine in 2015 and this person's um, in 2022. So and it, it's an academic publication, so I'm presuming it's a, it's probably a high quality publication. Yeah, uh, well, my understanding is it's I, I think it's either a, it's a Georgetown or I can't remember. Maybe it's John Hopkins who's the publisher. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, it'd be like in the future, it'd be really good to hear your thoughts on the scholar work, uh, the scholarly mm -hmm. level of the quality of the work. And um, because at least the dissertation is really interesting and like has a lot of, you know, it's awesome to mine it for citations and like, yeah. wow, random quotes and stuff like that. Um, uh, are So in your experience, are there any other scholars that are working on Henry George at the at now? or that we should try to look for? Um... That's a good question. I don't know of any, um, but, you know, what, what a lot of times, I don't know if anybody's working on, you know, besides sure. you know, this most recent publication, you know, a full-blown uh, biography, but George just shows up everywhere. So yeah. if you, if you, you could easily see, you know, a book on the Knights of Labor that comes out that has, you know, a full chapter on Henry George or, you know, considerable, or a history of, reform in New York City in, in the Gilded Age. Um, and that's where you kind of see his his comeback. You know, he's had periods of comeback mm -hmm. uh, in the past. You know, in the 1930s, Great Depression, the um, they reissue um, Progress and Poverty and it, you know, and it doesn't become a bestseller, but they sell a lot of books. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the book that I used was, there's a no sticky note on the inside from my dad that says, this is your grandfather's copy 1932 copy of progress and poverty and my grandfather was a you know an irish immigrant with a sixth grade education but very so much self-taught you know sure. and uh you know so i was i was telling students the other day i said you know this gives you an idea like if my grandfather with you know um a modest education was bought this book and almost certainly read it um you know it gives you an idea of that kind of the the you know continuing engagement that people have with the book sure. so i think circling back to your question i think henry george is definitely if not directly the object of study um he is showing up in lots of studies that are relevant to the you know the late 19th century just because he's such a pivotal figure 
um, whether it's you know his ideas on economics or connection to the labor movement or the running for mayor in, in 1886 or his anti-Chinese statements you know from the 1870s sure um, you know he, he does tend to does tend to show up um, as a you know I think if you run to the index of a of a there was a period where I was doing that all the time where I was trying to get my book out and every time I'd you know grab a new book and quickly go to the index, see how many George references and, you know, just making sure that I, you know, cause you, when you, when you're in the, in kind of a, whenever you're working on a book, you're always afraid of getting scooped, you know, you're mm -hmm. afraid that somebody's going to come out with one. Uh, you mentioned Jill Lepore, you know, one of her um, many, you know, the wide ranging publications. She's kind of a wonder uh, was a, was a history of wonder woman, you know, this, this cartoon, oh. you know, yeah. character. Um, and it turned out that some scholar, a different scholar had been working on a history of wonder woman, for like tw 10 years and her book came out, became a big bestseller. And then his book, you know, was published like six months later. And he actually had a pretty, he was pretty, I guess, what, what are you going to do about it kind of attitude? And so he wrote an, I think he wrote an article. You can look it up. It's called, uh, I got scooped by Jill Lepore. <laughs> you know, he, he's very fair minded. I mean, it's like, no, you don't own a topic. So, sure. you know, and he, you know, I think he even says I could have been a little faster in, in getting this thing out. So, that is a that is a concern. So anyway, my my uh, my repeated perpetual anxiety about somebody else putting out a book, you know, pretty much directly on the topic that I was doing, did not materialize. Thankfully, yeah. um, I guess. Oh, I'm thinking of another book. There was another one that just got released, but it's about Ireland, and it's like Henry George and the Irish way in question. Or I, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. I'll have to send you a link to both of them. Yeah, I mean, and that would be ease. that would be you know, like I have a chapter kind of an example of the opposite which is i have a chapter on henry george and the land league in, in ireland but that's definitely something that somebody could easily have written in, in you know an entire um an entire book on because mm -hmm. uh, it's a you know it's a big robust um mo moment in ireland and it's also connected to politics in the uk and in the united states so yeah i'm not surprised yeah. to see that yeah um I guess kind of on to that. Um, since tomorrow St. Patrick's Day, uh, yes, indeed. I, I'm I'm personally Catholic, uh, and you mentioned that you're Irish. Um, do what what is Henry George? What was his relationship like with the Catholic Church and Catholics? Because uh, I think there was maybe a bit of a difference. Um, yes. Uh, just can you just kind of give us a broad examination of what that looked like? Yeah. So George uh, grew up in a you know Protestant. I would say small e evangelical, you know, family, pretty pious family. His dad sold mm -hmm. religious books. He was born in Philadelphia in 1839. So he grew up kind of steeped in religion and, you know, going, you know, going to church and Sunday school. Um, so he's fully and, and he switches from, you know, he becomes a method. I can't remember his journey, but he switches around a little bit, but he basically stays pretty spiritual mm -hmm. in church going for much of his life. But he marries um, a woman named Annie Fox, who was Catholic. Um, and I, and so he, for the, most of his life, he's exposed to somebody who takes Catholicism seriously and probably wouldn't, um, wouldn't, you know, accept any kind of negative, you know, uh, anti-Catholic statements. I mean, on, on the part of anybody, including her, her husband. Um, so George has exposure to, to Catholicism. And then of course he gets involved in the land league, which is mostly a Catholic peasant, uprising uh, in Ireland trying to you know because 90 percent of Ireland is owned by a handful of families of English background you know the great majority of people live as peasants you know mm -hmm. eking out eking out a living and so forth um, so he becomes quite sympathetic to uh, Catholics and Catholicism but he does you know at, at a certain point draw the ire of super conservative Orthodox Catholic clerics in the United States who are really anxious about the Knights of Labor, about socialism, about basically any kind of reform, women's rights, suffrage. Um, they're saying this is all, you know, the, the dangerous, um, anti-establishment, anti-order uh, thinking. And this is going to, you know, we need to fight this. Um, so the, the church's position, you know, through much of the 19th century on any kind of reform issue or what we might call progress was no. <laughs> no um no to democracy no to science no to women's suffrage no to you know labor unions and labor rights and so forth um so he does kind of have a, you know and his book gets effectively put on the forbidden index um in in the vatican basically saying it's a it's so dangerous 
full of so many dangerous, you know, ideas that we need to let the word go out that Catholics mm-hmm. in good standing cannot read um, this book. It probably, like a lot of these bands, it probably ended up selling more books than it, than it <laughs> did in terms of keeping it away from people. Um, and he, one of his best friends, his followers, was a man named Father McGlynn, who is a pastor at a very poor parish in New York City, who, like a lot of people, somebody handed him a copy of Progress and Poverty, and he just said, you know, the scales fell from my eyes, mm-hmm. and I suddenly realized poverty is a man-made manufactured condition it's not natural you know and all everything i've ever been taught about just sort of living with it and dealing with it and trying to minimize it uh, is false and so he becomes a big georgist and so he becomes a rock star on you know the georgist and the land league and then you know as a, as a kind of a spokesperson he whenever he spoke he sort of said to catholics no matter what the the despite what the vatican says about henry george if this you know catholic cleric of great standing says he's cool you know, he's, he's cool. So, um, but then, you know, he, George does uh, have basically exchanges with uh, Pope Leo in the 1890s. And um, the church, though, in, I, I'd have to get the date, you know, dates worked out, but, you know, Rerum Novarum is the big encyclical that is, you know, mm-hmm. the big, you know, encyclical. I'm trying to think of a simple way of saying what it is, but like a proclamation of teaching, you know, sure. Yeah. Um, church issues these every now and again. And, it softened the church softened its position on labor unions and said labor unions are fine. They have to be under the, you know, they they have to be certain kinds and they have to be subject to certain kinds of, you know, influences. But so the um and so the church kind of a not necessarily through George, but through through sort of observing what's happening all across industrializing Europe and in the United States that they needed to kind of give a little bit on that front. Mm-hmm. Um and and George was definitely part of that conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. Uh, I have you ever read about uh, Father McGlynn's statement where they basically he was excommunicated or whatever yeah. by the bishop uh, at the time um, of, of New York, I guess, to overseeing him. And then he wrote a little statement saying, "This is the land philosophy." Um, and I guess they said, "You're back. Like um, you can come back now." But then he died like three months later or something. Um, yeah, and it was. Um... Yeah, so he gets excommunicated by Archbishop Corrigan, who's like uh-huh. the ultimate, ultimate, you know, conservative cleric, um, fearful of any kind of radicalism and all, and just, you know, summarily ex- excommunicates uh, McGlynn, um, which has a real kind of, puts the, really frightens, of, no doubt, we can't measure this as historians, but, you know, it certainly seemed to have put a chill on Catholic enthusiasm for mm-hmm. George and the labor movement and all. Um, yeah, and so and then he's you know McGlynn is um, sort of in exile for a while, but then you know slowly but surely over time, I think it's about a two year process. Um, he is reinstated, so McGlynn loses. I mean, uh, Corrigan loses, but then McGlynn like moves him to, you know, I don't know what the upstate New York equivalent of Siberia is, but some <laughs> tiny little town that is not you know, and and he does die a couple a couple years later. So uh, yeah, he's one of those interesting sub figures in that story um, of George, George's rise and, you know, influence in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. What, um, what was the role of the Anti-Poverty League in all of this? Um, Was that headed by Father McGlynn? Yeah, he he forms, he forms, um, he starts giving, you know, sermons slash lectures every Sunday night, you know, and drawing huge crowds of people including lots of non-catholics non-christians mm-hmm. even and um yeah so and eventually founds this anti-poverty league and it's basically a parallel organization to what what you know what george is doing and they're basically most of them are very enthusiastic single taxers or or georgists um because what's fired up mcglynn and what's you know animating his ideas about reform is george's principles and argument and so he's and McGlynn is helping sort of to translate that to a, an audience um, and, and gaining gaining steam. And, you know, it, it basically takes those lines that George says, which I think I just sort of paraphrased a few minutes mm-hmm. ago, which is that poverty is not natural. I mean, mm-hmm. or, or, the, or mass poverty is not natural. Poverty is manufactured, um, whether it's unintentional or not. We manufacture it by our policies, by our tax policies, by our land use policies. But, you know, there's a whole long list of things today. We throw in things like wages and and insurance and all of that. So um, that is the, you know, the Anti-Poverty League is with George uh, McGlynn is saying, 
let's be part of this effort to sort of open people's eyes to see the artificiality and the fixability of poverty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Um, what, this is kind of uh, maybe an easier question. Do you think students should be required to learn about Henry George in any level of school? We'll just make it easy. Well, I mean, I think, I think um, one of the ways that you track, I never you know, did this scientifically with like a ruler, but you know, if you were to look at 18, 1980 U.S. history textbooks and then 1990 U.S. history textbooks in 2000 and two, uh, there's definitely, it seems to me, like just my own anecdotal, re you know, reading of U.S. history textbooks, that George is getting more column inches, you know, where he might get a sentence mm -hmm. in 1970 or 1980. Um, he's definitely, because we were sort of rethinking the Gilded Age in general and the labor movement, but I think George is definitely getting a lot more um, a lot more attention. I don't know if, you know, if in, um, say, AP U.S. history courses, how much, or like, because AP U.S. history has a lot of primary source documents. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, and they change them year after year, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised over the last 20 years that if on a couple of years, um, a passage from progress and poverty has been one of the, you know, Gilded Age labor problem um, Problem, you know, document sets. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I, I don't know if I would say required reading, but I would say, you know, anybody who fancy who would consider themselves, you know, a a well-read person on the, on U.S. history should definitely know the essence of what Henry George stood for. In the same way that you would want to know, you know, about uh, you know Frederick Douglass, and if only one document to read his July Fourth uh, oration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the 1850s and, you know, Eugene Debs and um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you know, it's kind of the, the pillar figures that have not just shaped, but reshaped our society uh, over time. They're, they, they, you know, if there's, I don't want to say Mount Rushmore, but like a hall of fame of people that have um, played an important role um, beyond, you know, Martin Luther King and some of the ones that we immediately recognize. George is definitely in that, both for what he was doing in his lifetime. Um, but also sort of that legacy thing, the kind of echoes of George um, decades on. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I do think I've seen some people kind of uh, all mention on TikTok, like, hey, I heard of Henry George in my AP history class, but mm -hmm. it's not very many people um, just like a couple. And I mean, I, I took AP history, so uh, yep. I, but I definitely didn't learn about him there. I actually learned about him in debate, uh, in high school debate. It was just okay. like somebody had a random throwaway position. And they were like, we should do this land tax thing. And I had no idea whatsoever what it was or who he was. Um, and then fast forward like eight years, I learned about him more in college, like online. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it just kind of grew from there. Um, Okay, well, we're kind of getting near the end of time. I, I see like we have about 12 minutes, but um, yep. I'm not like strict for anything. But um, I guess uh, kind of what um, influence do you see uh, Henry George having on? Um, and I think maybe George just really highlight this because MLK quoted Henry George in one of his writings about basic income and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, Maybe this would be a better question, but uh, what are some of your favorite Henry George writings that are not progress and poverty? If you can remember back to reading mm. through some of them. Well, let's see. I mean, it, it, that is a, a bit of a tall order. I don't remember <laughs> specifically, but um, the other book that he publishes in that period. So Progress and Poverty comes out in 1879 in 1883, I think. Um, he's By then, he's written a bunch of big essays for publications that are sort of the equivalent of the Atlantic Monthly um, okay. today, you know, the Century Magazine. And I can't, I can't remember North American Review. I can't remember which one he he published in. Um, in fact, this relates to the his reference to the professor who <laughs> had his very, and he's speaking directly about William Grant, William Sumner, who was the professor at Yale, who was the America's foremost social Darwinist, who was just saying, forget the poor. They're poor because they're losers, they're drunkards, their job is to die and make society better. And, you know, so that's who he's referring to. And in these about 12, 14 essays that he wrote, 
um, he cobbles them together in this book called Social Problems. And it's it's a great book to read because it's it's some of it's very topical. Like some of them are on immigration uh, or, you know, mostly on immigration and mm -hmm. mostly, you know, so you can kind of see George deepening. Now it's four years on from his first book. Um, he's deepening his thinking and 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 talking about um, different things more more and more in depth, sort of applying Georgism to all kinds of other uh, issues that he didn't get to uh, in the book. So I would say, you know, picking up a, a copy of, um, of social problems, again, also still in print, um, is probably a good place to start. Um, the other one, if you want to go way back to the origin story, um, the Overland Monthly, I think that was the publication, uh, published, so when he's out in California, and the Transcontinental Railroad is completed in 1869, um, it really doesn't start to really be seen until the early 1870s. He writes this incredible essay called "What the Railroad Will Bring," mm. and it's 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 progress and poverty in you know seed form. He doesn't even know this, but he basically says, "Look, the railroad is," and we have to remind ourselves in the 21st century, the railroad was like the space shuttle, you know, it was or the super collider. It was the most astounding, <laughs> transformative technology. It's not a choo choo that your grandma takes you to, you know, at the old you know, historic park when, you know, it choo-choo's around. No, no, this is a transformative machine. And so George is saying, look, this incredible new thing is going to open up California to the world. It's going to lead to all kinds of development and all kinds of people and, you know, economic growth, et cetera, et cetera, comma. However, it's also <laughs> going to, it's also going to bring inequality and the rise of a moneyed class Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So he's he's on to this problem of progress, which he's, he said, wouldn't you wouldn't you think that progress would mean that everybody does better? Maybe not the same amount, but you know that we'd progress to a higher level of society. And here we are in the Gilded Age where we're progressing in categories like economic growth and wealth creation and industry and technology, but we see more poverty. Why is this so? Mm -hmm. Well, he's on to that problem. Way back in, I don't know, it's 1871, 72, something like that. It's, you can find it pretty easily. It's uh, What the Ra Railroad Will Bring, um, Overland Monthly, Henry George. I'm sure there's a, there's a copy of it somewhere, or, you know, a, a, um, a digital version of it somewhere. Yeah, that's good. I'll, um, I'll try to post all the things that you've mentioned in the description of the video down here below. And, okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's really good information because I've had other people recommend different things. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's some things like, I, you know, it's kind of funny you mentioned progress and poverty. The original is like 600 or some pages. And uh, yeah, it's like I think my copies. My copy is 543, I think, for some okay. reason, the numbers. Yeah. 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 yeah, maybe that's the exact, um, but like, it's only at the end that you're like, wow, that is compelling writing. At yeah. first, this is like, <laughs> every yeah. chapter is like difficult to slog through, but you're like that final one where he kind of describes what could happen and all the, you know, is just yeah. really compelling. <laughs> yep, um, yep. I've, you know, chapter two of my book is basically a, a slow, you know, examination of, you know, book by book, you know, it's it's books and then chapters within books. And uh, I've had so many people say to me, God, that has, he said, how did you write? How did you end up, you know, long, I think it took me six months to write that chapter because I had to read, you know, every word that, you know, it's old economics history. So I'm like, I know I have like a passing knowledge of David Ricardo uh, and I certainly know Malthus, but like, who is, what is he talking about here? And so I, it took me a while to figure that out, but that, that one sort of 30 page dive into the book is, it won't, it doesn't tell you everything. So I won't tell you, you can, that's your shortcut, but it is kind of a cliff note indication of the general main points of each of, of the 10 books in the, in the book, in the, in his, you know, his overall book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, maybe, and we've kind of touched on it here and there um, and just to kind of cap us off, what would you say Henry George's legacy is? What can we learn maybe from it um, today uh, the most um, or that you would like to highlight? Yeah, I mean, his whole, like his idea, that what got him going was he said, economics as a profession is totally off base. We are listening to, to people that don't know what they're talking about, or they are willfully misleading us, um, speaking on behalf of vested interests. And so, so a lot of his, his goal was to write this progress and poverty book and kind of blow economics out of the water. And, you know, in some ways, maybe he envisioned that he'd become, you know, the chair of economics at a kind of a new economics department. Um, he always kind of felt stiffed by the by the academy. 
So questioning economic dogma, you know, um, there's a, a new book I just saw come out, um, uh, explaining the big myth, debunking the big myth, something big myth. And the mm -hmm. subtitle is, you know, how big, how business got us to hate government and love the free market. And, you know, that's a, that's a 50 that you could pick a different, you could say mid seventies at university of Chicago economics uh, school becomes very influential. And that's really, you know, Milton Friedman and the free market is the, you know, free market is not only is it a great thing, it's, it's a natural thing. Like, you know, mm -hmm. this, you know, the, this idea that it's, it's self-evident and that government is bad and the smaller the government, the better, lower the taxes, the better. It, and, you know, that all really from, you know, 1980, uh, up to the pre present day, or well, up to say 2008, um, those ideas, you would ask a auto mechanic who hasn't really thought a whole lot about economics and they'd say, oh yeah, unions are terrible. Um, you know, minimum wage is bad. Government is bad. I want, you know, lowest possible taxes because uh, it's all going, being wasted. And like, how do you, how does that guy learn that, right? That's, that's a project that vested economic interests um, have been, in hundreds of different ways, creating think tanks, endowing chairs at universities, writing books, et cetera, et cetera, influencing people so that the average American's kind of default position is, yeah, I don't really like unions, you know, mm -hmm. I'm really not, you know, not big on unions and I'm not really big on, you know, minimum wage. And I'm not really big on, you know, uh, I want my taxes to be absolutely low. I also want my public schools to be the absolutely very best. I want my streets plowed. <laughs> I want parks, you know, uh, there's a Southside Johnny song that is always in my head, which is the, I don't know if it's the title of the song or it's the uh, the refrain, which is "All I want is everything." And this is a book. <laughs> on, this is a book I'm going to write someday, or in my head anyway. Which is like, as Americans, all we want is everything. What's wrong with that, right? We want zero taxes and the best public services, public mm -hmm. schools, parks, you know, streetlights that work. We want all of that, you know. And so, um, anyway, back to your question. One thing that George, you know, the the one sort of main takeaway from George is to like say challenge economic, you know, leading economic theory, you know, that says that, that you clearly can see favors those who have those with advantage, those in positions of power, those who don't know anybody who's ever been on um, unemployment uh, or has ever been evicted from an apartment. Um, those, you know, challenge that. So those economic mm -hmm. dogmas are different from the late 19th century, but they're not that different. And mm -hmm. we, we have imbibed and it's seeped into our political culture over the last 50 years to be seem seemingly self-evident. And suddenly now you're starting to see, particularly among young people, you know, those conservatives freak out when they say that, you know, 77% of, you know, millennials and younger have a favorable view of socialism. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, because it's they're seeing it as a corrective to what they now can see right in front of their face, which is um, a system that is not not designed or it is designed to favor the the smallest number of pe people possible mm -hmm. and is punishingly cruel to lots of uh, lots of people. And so, you know, socialism may not be the answer, but something trending, something socialistic ish, you know, um, which is what Holy, Henry George's ideas were sort of in that sort of vaguely socialist. Um, uh, category mm -hmm. same like Eugene Debs. He wasn't really a true blue European socialist. He's more of a Georgist in that regard. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot more attention being paid to seeing those, seeing you know, taking a, a fresher look at our economic dogmas and seeing whose interests they serve. And you know, that's why don't we leave that? That's a good help, hopeful uh, note to 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 leave it on. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That was really a good point. The, um... Yeah, that's a really good way to end it. And I really, again, I, I appreciate your time and want to thank you again um, for the bottom of my heart that you yeah. even spoke to me. You're the first person. I do plan on trying to reach out to more professors and more uh, thinkers like yourself that are of your uh, high caliber of work. Um, and it'd be maybe one day we could get like a panel or something and do something cool or like have a chat with more, even more people, but way yeah. in the future. So, all right. Well, that sounds good. And, you know, um, I'm very, very much present on all forms of social media, but I've never actually done a live chat before in any of these platforms. So um, I enjoyed this thoroughly, but I also enjoyed the opportunity to have my first crack at, um, at doing one of these live things. So it was incredibly technologically speaking, quite easy. You made it easy. I popped it in and there we were. Good. Glad, I'm glad that it was 
YouTube made it easy for us. So I appreciate it and happy to provide that opportunity. And I really, again, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. It's good to hear from an expert um, who has been very credentialed and is uh, you, as influential as you are. I love your Weemsy Awards and things like that. I watch <laughs> your content a lot. So yeah. I think it's all great. So well, uh, we yeah, should, again, we I should give, it. if I may give a plug to anybody who's listening, you know, all my social media is the same thing. It's at in the past lane with a P. So yeah. I N T H E P A S T L A N E. You can find me on TikTok and um, YouTube and um, Twitter and all that stuff. So yeah, cool. you can check out all the, all the things. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And thank you again for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and have a happy St. Patrick's day tomorrow. Indeed. All right. I'm actually bolting out to a pre St. Patrick's Day event uh, just down the street from me. So, oh, awesome. That's good to hear. Have All right, great. Day. Well, take take care. All right, thank you.